い対戦です8勝2敗の横綱貴乃花2度目の挑戦です貴乃花とは2度目の対戦9勝1敗朝青龍So, can anyone guess what clip that was about? I'll give you a clue. The first two words are sumo wrestling. Oh, oh crud. I think I just gave it away. <laughs> G'day, everyone. Welcome again to the Bamboo History Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen, bringing to you another episode of Chinese and East Asian history content. Today, We're going to be bringing to you a Japanese history special about the history of sumo wrestling. <laughs> Yoshi. Please subscribe to my podcast and to my channel. I really appreciate any support that I can get. And yeah, I've got heaps of visual content and visual aids on my Instagram account as well. So check that out too at Bamboo History Podcast. Also, I'd really appreciate it. If you could leave this podcast a good review from whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. And once again, just want to say thanks to everyone who's been tuning into my podcasts. I really appreciate your support. Okay, so now let's just get straight into today's episode. Before we dive into the history of sumo wrestling, does everyone know what sumo wrestling is? Well, for those of you who don't know, sumo wrestling is Japan's national sport. It's wrestling between two people inside an elevated ring called a doyo, spelt D O H Y O, which is 4.55 meters in diameter. The rules of sumo are simple. The first person who steps out of the doyo ring or touches the ground with any body part besides their feet loses. Games only last for a few seconds. It's actually quite rare for any games to last more than a minute. So, yeah, the games are quite short compared to, you know, test cricket. <laughs> And unlike other wrestling sports like Greco Roman wrestling, there are no weight divisions. Everyone competes together regardless of how much you weigh. So that means if you're only 50 kilograms, you could face off against someone who's 150 kilograms, you know, three times your body weight. And that is why professional sumo wrestlers eat heaps of food to get really big, you know, in order to get a weight advantage over their opponents. Whilst anyone can become a sumo wrestler, only men. Can become professional sumo wrestlers. The Japanese Sumo Association currently governs sumo wrestling with its headquarters in Tokyo. Professional sumo wrestlers are each allocated a class based on their skill called a banzake. To all the listeners who are Japanese speakers, apologies if I'm butchering the Japanese pronunciation. Japanese is not my native language. So, yeah. The top class, the, the banzake, is called a makuchi, and the second class is a joyo. And sumo wrestlers can move up and down a class based on your performance. So if you do really well, you go up a class, and if you don't do so well, you get demoted. And when you wrestle, you wrestle with the people from the same class as you. So people in the makuchi class would wrestle with another person from the makuchi class, etc., etc. The very best sumo wrestlers, i.e., the grand champions, are called yokozuna. Once you become a yokozuna, 
you can't be demoted at all. But the norm is that if you do start performing very poorly, you know, consistently, you are expected to, you know, retire if you are a Yokozuna. Sumo wrestling is a huge part of Japanese culture, and to the eyes of non-Japanese people, it's literally two big guys going at it in the ring. But as you all know, with many of these things that look very simple, its history is very, very interesting and mysterious at the same time. So let's dive into the history now, shall we? Wee! Ikazo! The earliest mention of sumo wrestling comes from a book called Kojiki, spelt K O J I K I, which was published around the year 7112 CE. The account from the Kojiki is mythical, and the Kojiki itself is a compilation of various myths, legends, oral traditions, and semi historical accounts. In the Kojiki, it speaks of a god named Takemikazuchi no Kami, who is a heavenly god sent to earth to control the earth gods. Takemikazuchi no Kami was renowned for his super strength, but one of the earth gods, Takeminakata no Kami, decided to challenge his strength, and so they tussled. Takemikazuchi won the fight, and many Japanese people see this fight between these two gods as the first ever sumo match. Another book, the Nihon Shoki, which was a book published 8 years later in the year 720 CE, has a different origin story of sumo wrestling. Again, this is also a mythical story. The Nihon Shoki attributes a god called Nomi no Sukune, spelt N-O-M-I-N-O-S-U-K-U-N-E, as the founder of sumo wrestling and the god of sumo wrestling. Similar to Takemikazuchi no Kami, Nomi no Sukune was renowned as one of the strongest beings in Japan, and according to the story, in the year 23 BCE, the Japanese emperor sent Nomi no Sukune to subdue another god called Taima no Kahaya, who was also famous for his strength as well. The wrestling match was legendary between Nomi no Sukune and Taima no Kahaya, and it was also said to have been the first ever sumo match in Japan. And how did this match go? Well, it was said that Nomi no Sukune won by killing Taima no Kahaya with only two kicks, one to the ribs and one to the back. Wow, a two-kick KO move. Not as good as One Punch Man, but geez, if you can kill someone with two kicks, goodness knows what you can do, right? Anyway, these stories obviously aren't real, but it does highlight that the origin of sumo wrestling is deeply intertwined with Shintoism, which is a native Japanese religion. So you're probably all thinking then, Ah, oh, Stephen, all these stories are mythical. What about the real life origins of sumo wrestling? Choto mate, I'm getting to it. It's been said that sumo wrestling originally started as a ritual dance to entertain the gods, as well as to encourage and predict good harvest of crops. The earliest archaeological evidence was figurines of sumo wrestlers that were unearthed dating back to the Kofun period, that's K-O-F-U-N, which was a period in Japan between the 3rd and the 7th centuries CE. The first recorded instance of sumo wrestling, you know, not a story about fighting gods, is in the year 642 CE, where sumo matches were held by Empress Kogyoku to entertain foreign dignitaries. We need to understand, though, that these sumo matches were a lot different from the sumo wrestling matches that we see today. The earliest sumo matches didn't have set rules, and they were often just wild tussles between two guys trying to submit the other onto the ground. Sumo wrestling matches, however, did become part of organised events during the Heian period between the 9th and the 12th centuries. 
For example, it became part of the Sumai no Sechi annual imperial ceremony. But still, up until this point, sumo wrestling was only something that the emperor, the imperial family and the elite aristocrats could enjoy watching. It was definitely something that commoners couldn't enjoy, and it was definitely not on YouTube back in those days. Sumo wrestling started expanding outside imperial circles during the Kamakura period, which was between the 12th and the 14th centuries, when it started being held during festivals at Shinto shrines around the country. This was also a period which saw the dominance of military dictators called Shogun, and they enjoyed watching sumo matches, so much so that the Shogun and their commanders also began hosting sumo matches. Its expansion through military circles, especially amongst samurai who also began to emerge during the Kamakura period, was mainly because sumo wrestling was seen as a very important way of training one's physical strength. A famous example of a samurai who loved sumo wrestling was the famous Oda Nobunaga. He would hold sumo wrestling tournaments every year, and as many as 1,500 sumo wrestlers would attend per event. Crazy, isn't it? During the Edo period of Japan, between the 17th to the 19th centuries, that was when the modern form of sumo wrestling took shape. This was done on the back of many previous bans of sumo wrestling by the government, because up until then, uh, sumo wrestling, there was no set rules for sumo wrestling, so it was literally two guys having a go at each other. So the government saw it as wild and unruly, hence all these bans. So it meant that it was important to create some rules and systems in order to keep sumo wrestling alive and not for it to be banned continuously. So during the Edo period, an official sumo organisation was established where sumo wrestlers could turn pro and set rules were created. Beginning the late 17th century, sumo matches were organised to raise money to construct and maintain shrines and temples, as well as to replace bridges. By hosting sumo matches like this, this helped spread the sport to commoners, and for the first time during the Edo period, not only were rules established, you could turn professional as a sumo wrestler, but also commoners could watch this sport as well which hence made it very popular amongst Japan. And that's where it brings us to the present day, where we now see sumo wrestling as a uniquely Japanese sport. But it's not just a sport, it's a cultural expression, a religion, which when displayed to the outside world, makes all of us non-Japanese people go, wow, that sumo wrestling, that is quintessential Japan. Sumo wrestling is now a modern sport, but many of its traditional characteristics still remain. For example, the referee, or gyoji in Japan, still wears traditional clothing. The two sumo wrestlers, or known in Japanese as rikishi, stomp and slap their bellies to scare off evil spirits, testament to the sumo wrestling's mythical origins. And they also throw salt inside the doyo ring to purify the arena before starting off their match. Sumo wrestling, once a secret only known to the emperor and his family, is now known globally. We can all now witness firsthand how sumo wrestlers live, train, as well as eat. Yeah, and that's right, listeners, I'm referring to that famous chankonabe hot pot diet. To me personally, I'm just really curious as to what motivates someone to do sumo wrestling. I acknowledge that if I was Japanese, I would see this as an honourable thing to do. But a sumo wrestler greatly compromises their health to do this sport. A big example of that is that an average lifespan of a sumo wrestler is like 10 years less than that of an ordinary Japanese male, which is mainly because of their diet and their heavy weight. So to any listeners out there who understand a lot about sumo wrestling, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as to what motivates someone to do sumo wrestling. 
So yeah, that's it. That was the story of the history, a brief history I'd say, of sumo wrestling. I hope you all learnt something new about this Japanese national sport. Please remember to subscribe to my podcast, visit my website, follow my Instagram. I'll leave all those details in the description box below. If you want to contact me by email, my email address will be there too. And don't forget, please leave me some feedback on whatever platform you're listening to the Bamboo History podcast on. I'd greatly appreciate your support. And by that, I mean good feedback. Thank you, guys. Okay, I'm off to go do some wrestling. I mean, uh, watch a sumo game. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this Japanese history special episode. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and I'll see you all next time on the Bamboo History podcast. Bye for now. Sayonara.